So much has changed since last Easter. The world has been shaken. Life has been disrupted. What we once called normal seems like it may never return. It's been easy to be discouraged, to lose hope, to feel the foundations of our faith begin to crumble. It's hard to keep our feet planted when the ground beneath feels like shifting sand. Now more than ever, we need to stand on the truth of Easter, a day which changed our eternity, changed our world forever. Death was defeated by life. Sin was consumed by mercy. The grave was swallowed up by victory. See, even in the darkest of moments, the love of Jesus could not be stopped. His faithfulness could not be broken. And when the dust settled, Jesus, he stood alive and victorious. Today, may we remember the truth of Easter, the power of the resurrection, and the promise of eternity. Yes, the world has been shaken, but the grave, it's still empty. And Jesus, he's still risen. Easter everyone. This is the time of the year when I usually say, He is risen! And you say, He is risen indeed. <laughs> Through a screen though, that feels a little lonely, doesn't it? Our second Easter in a global pandemic and now in another lockdown, it's left many of us feeling worn out, empty, and anxious about what comes next. We can feel helpless and inadequate. It's what some people call not enoughness. I was reading an interview that Andrew Garfield did to promote the movie Silence back in 2017. He played a priest who suffered persecution in Japan in the mid-1600s. To prepare for the role, he immersed himself in spiritual practices and the reading of scripture. And he said that he experienced a love for Jesus. At one point, he shared that the thing he most wanted Jesus to heal was his feeling of not enoughness. He described it as a feeling of that forever longing for the perfect expression of this thing that's in, inside each of us, that wound of not enoughness, that wound of feeling like what I have to offer is never enough. Do you know what he's talking about? Now, I was pretty sure that he'd made up the word, but then I Googled it and realized it's a thing. Lots of people talk about it. It's a feeling you have when you've blown it or when you're convinced that you will blow it. It's a feeling you have when you're sitting at a table and you feel you don't deserve to be there. It's a feeling you have when you experience people's disapproval or when you feel the weight of your own. What do you do with that? Not enoughness is exactly what I think the disciples were feeling in the passage that we'll look at this morning. And it's that not enoughness that was healed through an Easter encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Seeing how Jesus healed their not enoughness then helps us understand how Easter heals our not enoughness today. And it all happens during a breakfast with Jesus recorded in John chapter 21. If you don't have a Bible handy, pause the video so you can grab one and follow along. I'll start reading at John chapter one, verse one. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was, it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. This is the word of God. Now, as the scene opens, the disciples are back in Galilee. They're still feeling numb from witnessing Jesus' crucifixion, and they felt the shame of having abandoned Jesus when he needed them most. Jesus had come to them twice while they were in Jerusalem, but they were just brief appearances that left them amazed but disoriented as well. Jesus told them that he'd meet them in Galilee, but they were uncertain about how to go on and confused about their future. After you've let someone down, how do you recover from that? Where do they stand with him? How would they go forward? They went out to fish. They weren't just passing the time, they needed something to eat. They were fishermen, so fishing should have felt natural. Now it felt like a demotion. They had left their nets to follow Jesus and now they'd returned to them. And they couldn't even do that right. They'd spent the entire night and caught nothing. The sun was starting to rise and they had nothing to show for all their work. Everything about their situation sm spelled inadequate, not enough. From the shore, they hear a voice. It's too dark to make out who it is, but he's shouting out some advo advice. <laughs> Don't you hate it when people do that? <laughs> they think they know how to do your job better than you do. <laughs> and this guy's almost 90 meters away, standing on the shore. What does he know? <laughs> In verse 6, he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. They're too tired to argue, too desperate not to try. So they humor him. So they cast their net and it fills up with so many fish that they struggle to even haul it in. John yells out, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps into the water and races to greet Jesus. Now, it may just look like a touching scene a happy reunion. But it's far more than that. It's more than that because this isn't the first time that the disciples have spent the night fishing without catching anything. It's not the first time that Jesus has told them where to find the fish. And it's not the first time that they let down their nets and bring in such a big haul that it freaks everyone out. In fact, that very thing, those very circumstances happened soon after their first meeting with Jesus in Luke chapter 5. In that instance, the response of Peter couldn't have been more dis different. Notice how Peter responded the first time in Luke 5 verse 8. It says, when Simon, pa Simon Peter saw it, referring to all of the fish that they had brought in, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Confronted with someone that powerful and that holy, he can't help but be overwhelmed by a sense of his own inadequacy. He feels the weight of his own sin, and he wants out from under it. The only solution he can think of is to get Jesus away from him. That's a pretty different response than the guy who hops out of the boat, runs toward Jesus after experiencing the very same miracle after Jesus' resurrection. It's different because Peter recognizes this isn't a coincidence. Jesus realized that the disciples were feeling disqualified after they'd abandoned and denied him. So he deliberately performs the same miracle that he did the first time he called them to follow. And the message is clear. Their inadequacies, inadequacies haven't disqualified them. Jesus is reinstating them and recommissioning them. He's erased the shame of their not enoughness. And Peter's diving into the water and his childlike splashing his way toward Jesus is just an expression of the joy that it creates. Have you experienced that? Without Easter, sin leaves us feeling exposed and wanting to hide. 
We keep our distance from God and other people who talk about him. We avoid fellowship. We don't get personal in prayer. We hide behind masks and we hide behind our performance. All we can see is how we don't measure up. But what I want you to see is that an encounter with Jesus can change that. Because of what he did on the cross, the disciples' betrayal could be forgiven. There was a way back after they had abandoned Jesus. They could have a new start. There was still a place for them on the team. As it says in Romans 10, 11, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Not enoughness taunts us with the reminder, we're not good enough. We don't measure up. But when we trust in Jesus, that shame is replaced with the joy of acceptance. We meet one whose opinion supremely matters and in him, there is no shame. There's no condemnation. There's no not enoughness. And so instead of hiding from God, we can run to him. Instead of pushing others away, we can draw near. Easter erases the shame of our not enoughness. Now let's pick up the story again at John 21, verse 8. I'll read down to verse 14. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out, got out on land, they saw a charcoal, charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? <laughs> they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, as they get to the shore, Jesus is tending a fire. He's cooking bread breakfast and already has fish and bread warming on the grill. He asks for some of the fish that they've caught. And once he's finished cooking everything, he serves everyone. Now, prior to the pandemic, we scheduled some early morning, Saturday morning elders meetings to discuss some important issues for the church. And on a couple of occasions, one of the elders invited us to his home and prepared breakfast for us. I, I don't know if women experience the same thing, but I think there's something particularly tender about a guy preparing a meal for other guys. I feel the same thing when we have our annual men's breakfast or men's canoe trips. And I can't help but think the disciples must have felt that. But beyond that, with the resurrection, the full realization of just who Jesus really is, is beginning to sink in for the disciples. And it makes what he's doing so much more remarkable. When the Son of God makes you breakfast, it's automatically a once in a lifetime event. Even a simple meal would taste like a banquet. And with limited time and opportunity, they'd have to ask themselves why Jesus would bother. And the only conclusion they could draw was that they mattered to him. He genuinely loved them and valued fellowship with them. And as they looked back at breakfast with the resurrected Jesus and people asked, what was it like? They would say, we were feeling cold and alone but as Jesus invited us to eat with him by the fire, we, were, we realized we would never be alone again. We were tired and he served us. We were hungry and Jesus filled us. And because Jesus is alive, we can experience that same filling today. Through faith in Jesus, we can experience the fellowship with Jesus that makes us whole. Easter fills the emptiness of our not enoughness. Now, let me pause here for a moment because maybe there are some of you who are finding this all a little hard to take. Is this real? Are we supposed to little, literally understand that after his death on the cross, Jesus came back to life and actually made breakfast for his disciples? If you're struggling to come to terms with how to take a passage like this, you're not alone. The disciples were actually feeling the same thing. 
In verse 4, when Jesus called to the disciples from the shore, he was less than 100 meters away, but they didn't recognize him. Do you know why? It, it, it was early morning and it wasn't completely clear, but it was also because it was still a little hard for them to wrap their minds around. They had seen him beaten and crucified, speared, wrapped in burial cloths, covered in 75 pounds of ointment to seal his body, and then placed in a guarded tomb. Even though this was the third time he'd appeared to them, they were still struggling to come to terms with his resurrection. In verse 12, there's a strange line that says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? <laughs> they knew it was the Lord. Now, guys don't usually need encouragement to eat, especially if they've been up working all night. But the idea that the person they had witnessed die was now sitting before them cooking breakfast is hard to reconcile. They're stunned and disoriented. They knew it was Jesus. But at the same time, they found themselves wanting to ask, is it really you? <laughs> And maybe that's what you're feeling. That's how I used to actually feel, actually. But consider the alternatives. If the disciples had just written this as a propaganda piece to gain a following for themselves, would they really have depicted themselves with so many flaws? Would you show Peter, the leader of the movement, denying Jesus three times? Could this have just been a legend? The problem is, it doesn't read like a legend. Did you notice in verse 8 that it mentions they were about 100 yards from land? Or how about in verse 11, where it says that their net contained 153 large fish? <laughs> Do you know why it says there were 153 fish? Because someone was so amazed, they figured they better count them. These are eyewitness details. They're the kinds of things that you record when you realize you're in an event that's so historic. And so as amazing as Jesus' resurrection accounts are, they're given to us as first-hand accounts to convince us of what actually happened. With that, let's see the conclusion of this account in verses 15 to 19. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Now, when we feel our not enoughness, what people, people typically say to do is just tell yourself that you are enough. We're encouraged to ignore the idea that we might have any problems and instead remind ourselves that we're fierce, strong, and amazing. <laughs> the problem is just repeating something that you don't quite believe doesn't make it so. And it doesn't take away the feeling of not enoughness either. Regardless, Jesus takes a completely different approach. He knows that we can't go forward without confronting our past. So in verse 15, he asks Peter a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now that might sound like a strange question, and it might not be obvious to you what Jesus is actually talking about. Do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than these disciples? That's not what Jesus is asking. The question is, do you think that you love me more than the other disciples do? 
It was a hard question to ask because it took Peter back to the greatest fa failure of his life. And the night before the crucifixion, when Jesus predicted that the disciples would desert him, Peter vowed that he'd be faithful to the end. In fact, he said, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. He was convinced that he did love Jesus more than the others. He thought he had more faith, more discipline, more self-control. But as we know, he denied even knowing Jesus three times that night. So Jesus asked him the same question three times, deliberately taking him back to the night of his great betrayal. The night which seemed to prove his not enoughness once and for all. And when Jesus asked him the third time, Peter felt the pain of it. Nobody wants to confront their worst sins or failures. In verse 17, he just answers, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He can't offer excuses or defense. He only appeals to what Jesus already knows. He says, says in effect, you know that I failed miserably, but you also know that I love you. Each time Peter confesses his love, Jesus responds graciously to reinstate him. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. It's a recommissioning. With the grace of Jesus, Peter's life is still capable of tremendous good and even tremendous faithfulness. In, in verse 18, Jesus predicts that Peter will himself be crucified as a martyr. That's what those languages of him spreading out his arms. And that's amazing for someone whose fear made him deny Jesus so spectacularly. Easter reverses the fear of our not enoughness. Notice how this has happened though. The world says to ignore sin and declare that you're enough. The advice to Peter would have been, stop thinking about his past failures and not have such unreasonable expectations. Just keep repeating, you are enough, you have enough, you do enough. But Jesus' approach is totally different. He instead calls us to confront our own sin, to admit our weaknesses and failures but at the same time, to see how they can be forgiven and transformed through faith in him. We can own our not enoughness because Jesus is enough. We don't fear our not enoughness anymore because Jesus completes us. By faith, we can be united to the only one who is truly enough. And so there's no more shame in not being enough. There's no more emptiness when you're connected to the one who fills you. There's no more fear when you're held by the one who can steady you. Because of Easter, we don't have to go through life trying to convince ourselves that somehow we're enough. We don't need to hide in the shame of our not enoughness. So let's stop asking the question, am I enough? And let's start asking the question, do I love the one who is enough? Three times, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me is a question that goes beyond religion. It's a question of loyalty. It's a question of relationship. It's a question of trust. And it's the only question that matters because everything flows from it. If you love Jesus, then you'll follow him. If you love Jesus, then you'll do what he says. If you love Jesus, you'll care for his sheep. And because of Easter, we can know that Jesus is alive. And through his word, he asks you the same question that he asked Peter. Do you love me? What's your answer to him? Maybe there's some of you who would say, I don't think I do, but I think I'd like to. Well, the way that you do that is by confessing your sin and admitting that you're not enough. Ask Jesus for forgiveness. He's the only one who is enough and we can be complete in him. And give yourself to follow him. We love because he first loved us. Maybe there are others who would say, as Peter did, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And what he meant by that was, you know that my love isn't enough, but you know that it's real. 
You know how I failed, but you know how I continue to cling to you. And if that's your heart, then draw near to the fellowship that Jesus invites you to. There's no more hiding with him, so stop hiding. Get close to the fire that Jesus has started, closer to Jesus and closer to other Christians. He's the one who fills you. He's the one who completes you. So hear his words to Peter. Follow me. You follow someone you love. Their words become precious to you. And when you, when you love someone, you make their priorities yours. You feed the sheep. You care for the lambs. Even though he knows everything about you, he thinks you're enough to do that. So respond to him in love and let him complete you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible grace that Easter shows us. The incredible grace and love of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for anyone hearing today longing to be completed by Jesus, longing to be filled by him. I pray that they would confess their sins, admit to you where they have failed you, where they have sinned against you. I pray that they would receive the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus Christ. I pray that they would name him as Savior and Lord. And I pray that they would follow. Father, I pray for those who know that they love Jesus, but can't help but feel that they're not enough and that even their love is not enough. Father, would you minister to them? Would you help them to see that in Jesus, there is no longer any need for shame. There is no condemnation. That the acceptance of the one whose opinion supremely matters takes away all of that, and there's no need for hiding. Fill us and complete us. And help us, Father, to respond. Help us to follow. Help us to show the love that we have for you, imperfect as it is. Help us to show it in the way that we serve, the way that we follow, the way that we fellowship, the way that we represent you before a watching world. May the reality of the re resurrection be demonstrated in our lives today. For we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I hope this message has helped you to see how Jesus heals our not enoughness. And if it's left you with questions or you need help taking the next step, then send me an email or leave a comment below. If this is a message you feel others need to hear, share the link and help spread the word. As always, for more messages of hope, visit gracebc.ca. God bless and see you next time.